Politically Correct by Geoffrey Archer. Never judge a book by its cover, Arnold's mother always used to tell him. Despite this piece of sage advice, Arnold took against the man the moment he set eyes on him. Arnold Pennyworthy. He was fed up with being told by all and sundry, that's an appropriate name for a banker, had been deputy manager of the Vauxhall branch for the past ten years. Recently, he had been offered the chance to move to Bury St Edmunds as branch manager. He couldn't wait to get out of London, which seemed to him to have been overrun by foreigners who had changed the whole character of the city. When Arnold's wife had left him without giving a reason, at least that's what he told his mother, he'd moved into Arcadia Mansions, a large block of flats which had the advantage of being within walking distance of the bank. The first time Arnold caught sight of his new neighbour was when they found themselves sharing a lift down to the ground floor. Arnold waited for him to speak, but he didn't even say good morning. Arnold wondered if the man even spoke English. He was a little shorter than Arnold, solidly built, with a square jaw, and what Arnold later described to his mother as soulless eyes. His skin was dark, but Arnold couldn't be sure where he was from. Arnold decided to have a word with the porter. Dennis was the fount of all knowledge when it came to what took place in Arcadia Mansions. When the lift doors opened, Arnold waited until the new resident had left the building before strolling across to join Dennis at the reception desk. What do we know about him? asked Arnold, nodding at the man as he disappeared into a black cab. Not a lot, admitted Dennis. Short-term lease, but he did warn me that he'd be having visitors from time to time. I don't like the sound of that, said Arnold. Any idea where he comes from? Not a clue, said Dennis. Don't misunderstand me, Dennis. I'm not prejudiced. I've always liked Mr Zabari from the other end of my corridor. Keeps himself to himself or is respectful. But then you must remember Mr Zabari is a radiologist, said Dennis. Well, I must get a move on. Keep your ear to the ground, Dennis. Although our masters have decided it's not politically correct, I have to tell you I don't like the look of this one. A few days later, Arnold was returning from work when he saw the new resident chatting to a young man dressed head to toe in leather and sitting astride a motorbike. The moment the two of them spotted Arnold, the young man pulled down his visor, revved up and shot away. Arnold found Dennis sitting behind the reception desk. Those two look a bit dodgy to me, he said. Not half as dodgy as some of the other young men who've been visiting him at all hours of the night and day. There are times when I can't be sure if this is Albert Embankment or the Khyber Pass. The lift door opened, and Mr Zabari stepped out. Good evening, Mr Zabari, said Dennis. Night duty again. I'm afraid so, Dennis. No rest for the wicked when you work for the NHS. As the man left the building, Dennis said, A real gentleman, that Mr Zabari. Sent my wife a bunch of flowers on her birthday. It was a couple of weeks later, after arriving home late from work, that Arnold spotted the motorbike again, parked up against the railing. Arnold walked into the building to find a couple of young men chatting loudly in a tongue he didn't recognise. They headed towards the lift, so he held back. When he got out of the lift at the fourth floor, he could hear raised voices from the apartment opposite his. Noticing that the door was slightly ajar, he glanced inside. A man was lying flat on his back, his arms and legs pinned down by the two men he'd seen getting into the lift, while the youth he'd spotted previously on the motorbike was holding a kitchen knife above the man's head. All around the room were blown-up photographs of the devastation caused by the 7-7 bus and tube bombings that had recently appeared on the front pages of every national newspaper. The moment the youth spotted Arnold staring at him, he walked quickly across the room and closed the door. For a moment, Arnold stood shaking. Then he ran across to his flat, double-bolted the door and put the safety chain in place. He dragged the largest chair in the room across, rammed it against the door and collapsed into it, trembling. He thought about phoning the police, but then became fearful that the man would discover who had reported him and the kitchen knife would end up hovering above his head. 
Arnold nipped across to the sideboard and poured himself a large whiskey. He drank it down in two gulps, then poured himself another before slumping back into the chair, his heart still pounding. He sat there, taking another swig, and then another, until he finally passed out. Next morning, when the time came for him to leave for work, he pulled the heavy chair back a few inches, then placed an ear against the door. Were the men standing outside in the corridor waiting for him to come out? He unlocked the door. Peeping into the corridor, he was greeted by silence and no sign of anyone. He tiptoed towards the lift, never taking his eyes off the door on the other side of the corridor. When he reached the bank, Arnold sat at his desk and began to write down everything he'd witnessed. Once he'd finished, he picked up the phone, dialed 999, and asked for the police. My name is Arnold Pennyworthy. I need to speak to a senior police officer. I have some important information concerning the possibility of a serious crime having been committed in which terrorists may be involved. Another click. Another voice. Arnold read his statement a second time. Hold on, sir. I'm going to put you through to a colleague at Scotland Yard. Sergeant Roberts, how can I help? Arnold repeated his prepared statement a third time. I think it may be wise, sir, suggested Roberts. If you didn't say too much more over the phone, I'll be with you as soon as I can. Arnold didn't leave his office that morning and was pacing up and down when there was a tap at the door. Arnold's secretary stood aside to allow a tall, smartly dressed young man to enter the office. Sergeant Roberts sat down opposite Arnold and opened a notebook. Arnold began by describing everything he'd seen during the past month, ending with a full account of what he'd witnessed in the flat opposite the previous night. That'll be enough to be going on with, said the sergeant, closing his notebook. So what happens next? asked Arnold. We'll put a surveillance team on the building, keep an eye on the suspect for a few days, and try to find out what he's up to. Once Arnold had moved to Bury St Edmunds, Running the branch took up most of his time, and as the weeks passed, the incident at Arcadia Mansions began to fade in his memory. Arnold had just finished interviewing a customer when the phone on his desk rang. There's a Sergeant Roberts on the line, said his secretary. Good morning, sir. I was wondering if you were planning to be in London during the next few days. I'd like to bring you up to date on what our surveillance team has come up with. Arnold began to thumb through his diary. I'll be coming up to London on Friday evening. It's my sister's birthday and I'm taking her to the Sound of Music at the London Palladium. Good. And I wonder if you could spare the time to pop into Scotland Yard, say, around five o'clock? Commander Harrison is very keen to have a word with you. Arnold's taxi swung into the forecourt of Scotland Yard a few minutes before five, and he was pleased to see Sergeant Roberts standing by the reception desk waiting for him. The sergeant guided him to the lifts, and then a door at the far end of a corridor. Commander Mark Harrison rose from behind his desk and gave Arnold a warm smile before shaking hands. Good to meet you at last, he said, waving Arnold to a seat. Let me begin by saying how grateful we all are at the yard for the information you supplied. I can say without exaggeration that you have been responsible for uncovering one of the most active terrorist cells in this country. Because of the information you supplied, Mr Pennyworthy, we've been able to arrest 15 terrorist suspects, one of whom... The man who rented the flat on your corridor was undoubtedly the cell chief. At a house in Birmingham, which he led us to, we discovered explosive devices, bomb-making equipment, and detailed plans of buildings, along with the names of high-profile individuals the group planned to target, including a member of the royal family. Frankly, Mr Pennyworthy, you contacted us just in time. Arnold beamed as the commander continued... I only wish we could make your contribution public, but you will understand the restrictions we're under in such cases, not least when it comes to your own safety. Yes, of course, said Arnold. But when you read the press reports of the case next week, you can take some satisfaction from knowing the role you played in bringing this group of violent criminals to justice. As Arnold made his way down Whitehall, he held his head high, wondering how much he could tell his sister about the meeting that had just taken place. He checked his watch and decided to hail another taxi. After all, it was a special day. The Palladium, 
said Arnold as he climbed into the back seat. The cab came to a halt on Great Marlborough Street, a police cordon preventing them from going any further. What's the problem? Arnold asked the driver. Must be a member of the royal family going to the show tonight. I'm afraid you'll have to walk the last hundred yards. Arnold made his way past the large crowd pressing against the safety barriers. When he reached the theatre entrance, his ticket was carefully checked before he was allowed to enter the foyer. He walked up the wide, red-carpeted steps and looked around for his sister. A few moments later, he spotted a programme being waved energetically. Janet was never late for anything. Let's go and find our seats, she said. A member of the royal family is expected in tonight, and I want to see who it is. I thought we'd go to Cipriani afterwards, said Arnold, once they'd settled down. Isn't that a bit extravagant, said Janet. Not on my sister's birthday, it isn't. It's turned out to be a rather special day for me as well. Why is that? asked Janet, as she handed him a programme. People began to rise and start clapping as the Princess Royal entered the royal box. Well, it all began when this man moved into our block. Who are you talking about? interrupted Janet as the lights went down. Arnold whispered as the conductor raised his baton. I'll tell you all about it over dinner. Arnold enjoyed the first half of the musical, and it was clear from the rapturous applause he was not alone. Several members of the audience peered up at the royal box where Princess Anne was chatting to her husband. Suddenly, the door at the back of the box opened, and a man whose face Arnold could never forget walked in, one hand in his pocket. Oh, my God, said Arnold. It's him. It's who, said Janet. The man. He's a terrorist. Somehow he's managed to escape and get into the royal box. Arnold didn't wait to hear his sister's next question. He squeezed past the people in his row and began to run towards the exit, pushing aside anyone who got in his way. Once in the foyer, he charged up the staircase that led to the dress circle and set off in the direction of the royal box. When he came to a red rope barrier, two burly police officers blocked his path. There's a terrorist in the royal box, shouted Arnold. The princess's life is in danger. Please calm down, sir, said the officer. The only guest in the royal box is Professor Naresh Khan, the American orthopaedic surgeon. He's over here to give a lecture on problems following 9-11. He may be posing as a surgeon, said Arnold, but I assure you he's an escaped terrorist. Call Commander Harrison at Scotland Yard. He'll confirm my story. My name is Arnold Pennyworthy. The two officers looked at each other, and then the senior officer dialed a number on his mobile. After what seemed an eternity to Arnold, the commander came on the line. So my name is Bolton, Royal Protection Team, currently on duty at the London Palladium. A member of the public, a Mr Pennyworthy, is convinced there's a terrorist in the Royal Box. He says you'll confirm his story. Yes, I'll put him on, sir. The officer handed the phone to Arnold. That man we discussed this afternoon, Commander. He must have escaped. I've just seen him in the Royal Box. That's not possible, Mr Pennyworthy, said the commander. The man we spoke about this afternoon is locked up in a high-security prison from which he's unlikely to be released in your lifetime. But I've just seen him, shouted Arnold. You must tell your men to arrest him before it's too late. I don't know whom you've seen in the royal box, sir, said the commander, but I can assure you that it isn't Mr. Zabari. The Stars by Bill Murphy Dear Sir, in response to your client's claim regarding the terms of the separation agreement with his former spouse, I wish to confirm our client's trenchant denial of... Then a familiar voice interrupted her. You ready for lunch? It was Tara, leaning over the small glass screen that fronted Hannah's desk and separated her from all the other legal secretaries and junior solicitors that peopled the large open-plan office of Lysander, Goff and Klein. Can't, Hannah replied. Got this memo to type up for Mark, she said, lowering her voice. Can't it wait, or does he get special privileges, Tara teased. Go on, enjoy your lunch, Hannah told her talkative friend. Oh, I'm just grabbing a bagel. I have to try and find something to wear for tonight, she said. You are going tonight, aren't you? 
The whole office will be there, I suppose, Hannah replied, showing no desire to attend the party given in honour of Mark Wilson, who was to be made the senior partner in the firm. His wife will probably be there, Tara cautioned her quietly. Anyway, if I don't see you after lunch, we can get ready together at the flat. You can help me squeeze into my new dress, she sang as she hurried off down the office. Hannah was about to return to typing the memo when her mobile phone chirped with an email from Facebook. Someone had replied to her post on Blood Eternal, a vampire fan group she had recently joined. Her heart jumped a little when she saw the familiar username, Peter X 51 Really enjoyed your post on the True Blood vs. Twilight battle. I'm definitely Team Jacob too, but he's no Lestat, that's for sure. But then, I'm old school. Like I said, we should meet up. I hope to be in London tonight. Hannah had been exchanging posts with Peter X 51 for nearly six weeks now sharing their views of everything from the rice novels, the schmaltzy charm of Buffy, the chemistry between Bella and Jacob, and above all, their shared love of the dark shadows and blanched porcelain features of Max Schreck in Nosferatu, the daddy of them all. Sometimes Peter X51 would send cryptic messages, puzzles for her to solve to find out what he was thinking. She was not sure how to reply. An adventurous yes, a sensible no, or a keep it going maybe. She glanced at her computer screen the cursor blinking mid-sentence on the unfinished memo. Better get back to work, she thought to herself. She would reply to her new online admirer later when she got home. Might even agree to meet him. Hannah left work about five, joining some of the other legal secretaries chattering excitedly about the party later. Mingling with all the other office workers draining out of the main door of the Canary Wharf Tower, Hannah wrapped her coat about her as a raw wind swirled about the plaza. Behind her, a familiar voice called to her. It was Mark. Thanks for getting that memo done for me today, he said, doubling up the collar of his smart Crombie. I appreciate it. No problem, it's my job. So, you've got your big night tonight? Yes, I suppose, he remarked modestly. You know how much I like you, he started solemnly. Right, she said warily, but... But, well, I don't know, he said. I just don't know where we can go with this. This, she said, letting him stew. Our affair, she reminded him. Look, it's not all me here. You know, I never said it would be a long-term thing. She wasn't quite sure if he was more annoyed by her or by his own faltering, clumsy break-up speech. And anyway, he continued, the stupid vampire thing you're obsessed with. I just don't get it. I mean, my 15-year-old daughter is into all that. She put her hand on his shoulder to stop him, unnerving him as she moved closer. For a divorce lawyer. You're rubbish at breakups. She just smiled and walked off, hoping that the other people she passed would notice the rivulets of black mascara streaking her cheeks. High above her, the fading sunlight seemed to move in a crimson band on the top reaches of the tower, the last waves of sunset over the city. It was getting late when she reached her flat in Camberwell, and taking off her coat she heard a hairdryer droning upstairs. Tara had already begun her three-hour ritual of getting ready for a night out. But Hannah plugged in her laptop and switched on the broadband modem, its little green lights flickering into life. She heard the hairdryer stopping. What time is it on again? She called up the stairs. What? Tara called back. The work thingy, what time is it on? Hannah logged onto her Facebook account. Free bar at eight, Tara shouted down. Until nine, she added with faint disappointment. So you'd better get your skates on. There's some quiche in the fridge if you want a quick bite. Hannah clicked on the link to the Blood Eternal group. Another post for her. Peter X 51, again. You should eat something, advised Tara as she rushed in, brushing out her hair. Line the stomach. You did hear me saying free bar, she added. Till nine, I heard you, said Hannah. You better start getting ready. You're not going to put on that black goth clobber you usually were. You could borrow one of my dresses. But Hannah was staring at her laptop. You! Is that your blood type? Tara cried suddenly, peering over Hannah's shoulder at the screen. Yeah, all the members of the group have to put in their blood type. I'm the only one with AB negative, though, she stated proudly. Less than one in a hundred people have it. It's a bit gross, isn't it, replied Tara. Stop reading my stuff anyway, Hannah rebuked her. Tara walked away, throwing her hands in the air, looking for some makeup she'd left lying around, as Hannah looked back at the screen to read the message from Peter X 51. I really think it's time we should meet. He suggested. We both think the same, have the same tastes. We seem to feel the same way about, well, everything. How about it? 
Tonight? Carpe diem? Their taxi drew up outside the plush Kensington wine bar, most of their co-workers enjoying the free cocktails and the warmth inside. As they got out, Hannah could feel the cool spots of rain on her face as a light drizzle descended on the city. Tara, after paying the driver, unfurled a small black umbrella and linked arms with her friend. Come on, the free drink will all be gone, she urged, but Hannah remained rooted to the spot. What is it? I can't, said Hannah. She was staring at Mark's wife inside near the bar, a knot of well-wishers around her, pecking her on the cheek. She was a pale beauty with large, deep blue eyes. She even looked a little bit like Bella in Twilight. Yes, you can. Forget about her, said Tara, tugging at her arm, but Hannah's phone was pulsing in her pocket. I'm stuck in traffic, but making my way south in the rain towards the city. I love the rain. Seems to make the world fresher. Meet me where Lucy lies in restless peace. Hannah stared at the screen. Where Lucy lies in restless peace. Of course, she smiled to herself. Van Helsing believed Lucy Westenra, one of Dracula's first conquests, was buried in Highgate, North London. Sorry, Tara, she said to her friend. You go on in. But where are you going? asked Tara, startled. I have some place better to go, her friend replied serenely. Tara knew her well enough to know she couldn't change her mind and shook her head in despair. Here, she said, handing Hannah the umbrella. You'll need this. And text me later to let me know where you are. Hannah just smiled, turned around, and checking the busy traffic, hurried across the rain-washed street between the slow-moving cars. Tara watched her friend disappear among the other night-goers, rushing from the pubs and restaurants, huddled beneath their umbrellas and raincoats. Delays in the underground gave Hannah time to question the wisdom of stealing across the city on this rainy night. In her mind, she realised it was dangerous to be meeting a man she'd never seen before. But she felt instinctively that he really knew her, that they had not just a shared love of vampires, but a real connection. She emerged onto the streets from Archway Tube Station with a sudden feeling of dizziness, like teetering on a precipice, on the verge of an extreme feeling of anticipation, or maybe she realised it was plain, simple fear. She was about to turn back into the station and return to the party when her phone beeped with several messages from him again. Follow me up to the church of the Green Dome past the cat, hissing in its cage. Intrigued, Hannah put up her umbrella and felt herself turning left, walking up Highgate Hill. The traffic quieter, more sporadic than the rows of cars snaking through the West End, hardly anyone on the pavement. As she made her way up the hill, her breath pluming in the cold damp air and passing the statue of Dick Whittington's cat, she finally arrived outside the domed green cupola of St. Joseph's, which loomed into the dark sky. She took out her phone as it lit up with an incoming message, specks of rain dotting its screen. Meet me outside the gates where the wild flowers grow. She knew instantly he meant the West Cemetery, which Van Helsing had described. Where the wild flowers grow, she repeated to herself. That was exactly how she saw herself, in the tedious conformity of school, the caged decorum of work, even amongst her own family and all the men she fell for, estranged, misunderstood, a wild flower. Leaving Highgate Hill, she made her way down the narrow steep lane to the gates of the old cemetery. Outside the sharp angles of the Gothic Anglican chapel that stood above the gates, she waited for a moment. Around her the darkness of the cemetery, its tombs and monuments standing silently over their long dead incumbents. She could not stop her mind from recalling the local myths of the Highgate vampire, once witnessed to have leapt a twenty-foot wall after cutting the throat of a dog. She shook the thoughts from her mind and decided to text Peter X 51, awkwardly holding the umbrella and her phone as she composed a very short message. Just a moment after hitting the send button, she heard a phone beeping somewhere behind her, emanating from the dark. A tingling spike of fear suddenly shuddered through her body. Who was this man? And what was she doing here? How could she be so stupid? She asked herself in a terrified panic. Searching the dark, she thought the sound of the phone came from a car parked further up the deserted lane and began walking tentatively towards it. Its headlights suddenly flashed on, the lines of rain streaming in their beams, making it hard for her to see the dark figure behind the wheel. 
The car then began rolling down the quiet street towards her, the tyres shuffling over the wet tarmac in a whisper. Instinctively, she turned away and began to run down the lane towards the lights of the house near the end. Dropping her umbrella and phone, she was about to scream at the top of her voice when the car roared after her, its headlights flaring, illuminating the slick, wet ground beneath her. She felt the sharp pain of its impact and the world spun around her, the angles of the chapel and the cemetery wall turning upside down. For a moment, she felt the rain tapping on her brow once more as she lay on the ground trickling warmly down her temples and neck as the car disappeared into the gloom, its red tail lights receding like the eyes of a demon. Further up the road behind her lay the umbrella Tara had given her, flopping in the wind like a bat's wing. Tara thought it was her alarm bleating to get her up for work, but it was early Saturday morning and it was her mobile phone ringing. Her head was tight and aching with a hangover as she squinted at the caller ID. It was Hannah. You're such a lazy cow, Tara said as she answered the phone, assuming she was in her bedroom just next door. But instead it was an officer from the London Metropolitan Collision Investigation Unit. He made some officious introductory remarks before regretfully informing her that her friend Hannah had died in an accident. A hit and run in Highgate. The driver had fled the scene. The morning rounds hadn't even begun in E-Ward of Harefield Hospital when the man in the corridor tapped at his Blackberry. With just a few key strokes using the digital footprint removal software one of the firm's investigators had given him, he was able to erase all traces of his profile and posts on Facebook. Tucking his phone away in his breast pocket, he then entered the room and went to hold his wife's hand. She smiled weakly at him cardiac monitor attached to her chest, relaying the rhythms of her failing heart. Good morning, the surgeon announced as he rushed in, glancing at a chart in his hand. A new heart will make you good as new. I can't believe it. Who is the donor? She asked, her voice dry and brittle from all the tests. You know, I can't tell you too much, he explained, but it came from a young woman here in the city. Car accident last night in North London. Fortunately for you, she was AB negative also. See?